Greetings to everyone and a very warm welcome to this webinar related to the centenary of the International Missionary Council. Yesterday we had our first public lecture titled From the Margins of the IMC and now we have the second one and tomorrow the third session celebrating 100 years of the International Missionary Council and its successor, the Commission on World Mission and Evangelism of the World Council of Churches. It is always the uh, same Zoom link, so it's easy to remember. So please join us tomorrow as well. My name is Risto Jukko, and I'm currently serving as the director of the Commission on World Mission and Evangelism of the World Council of Churches. I'm also the chair of the steering group of the International Missionary Council Center in study process organizing this webinar. In the session today, we have two important contributions, both from North America. And I do hope that these contributions will challenge us, inspire us, and encourage us in many different ways. Uh, let us start our session with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Holy Triune God, we thank you that you have gathered us to this meeting. We thank you that you have given us the Ministry of Reconciliation. We thank you for the history of the International Missionary Council and the legacy that the IMC has left to us and to the World Council of Churches Commission on World Mission and Evangelism. Today we present to you our work and plans and ask your blessing upon them, knowing and humbly acknowledging that you see and know them better than we do. And not only do we ask your blessing upon our work and plans, but we also commit ourselves in your care, body and soul and all that we have. Save us and this world of yours from all evil and sin and grant us to live and to be participants in your mission every day of our life, loving you and our neighbor and your creation. Amen. In this webinar, we have a great honor and privilege to hear first recorded, hear first recorded greetings from the USA. Ilona Street Stewart is co-moderator of the 224th General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church USA, and she's the first Native American to hold this position. She's also a ruling elder and serves as Synod Executive for the Synod of Lakes and Prairies. Prior to this, she served more than 20 years as Synod staff for racial ethnic ministries and community empowerment, including administra and administration support of Dakota Presbytery. We are pleased to have her as one of our speakers in this IMC centenary celebration. Let us listen to her. Greetings, honored guests, distinguished representatives, sojourners, and all my relations. How mitaku yape, chante washte nape chiyu zape, which in Dakota is hello, my relatives. I greet you with a warm heart and handshake. Welcome to the International Missionary Council Centenary Gathering here in New York. I'm glad for your safe travels and well being to come together for this commemorative moment in the long history of global workers whose spiritual discernment led them back in 1921 to form the International Missionary Council, which we know over time adapted to a changing world and decades later cooperatively joined other believers to become the World Council of Churches Commission on World Mission and Evangelism that lives today. I am Alona Street Stewart, co-moderator of the 224th General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church USA. My tribe is Delaware Nanticoke, and our ancestral home is the Eastern Woodlands along the shores of the Atlantic Ocean and waters of the Chesapeake Bay. Now I live in Minnesota. The state's name comes from the Dakota language, Mine Shota Makoche, land where the waters reflect the clouds and is the homeland of the Dakota and now the Anishinaabe and Ho-Chunk people and many other tribes. I am here because of who I am and where I come from and who are my relations. I ask you as we begin, to give recognition to the native nations, to the original people here, to be honored in our traditional way as the indigenous host of your 100th year commemoration. They were the months 
Lenape, the Lenape, which is the Algonquin speaking relatives of my people. And in these mountains and valleys also lived the Onondaga, the Mohican, and the Haudenosaunee. I tell you now, let us acknowledge them as the ones who sang the first songs here, offered the first prayers here, and let us tell them we are here to let them know what we're doing on their land and that we will be respectful in the way we walk and talk while we are here. Land acknowledgement like this is critical for others to recognize and value our past, present, and future, to listen to us as we say what it means to be alive and indigenous today. Our story is not finished. Our ancestors are ever present, protecting our occupied and misnamed homelands in this urban and countryside region. We continue to walk in their footsteps. We remember we are still here. To continue offering land acknowledgement, we encourage you to visit our sacred sites, to learn how to say our names, to listen to the difficult truths of history that may revise your stories during your visit in this country. I'm also grateful for the support of the Presbyterian Church USA, the United Methodist Church, the National Council of Churches of Christ, the Protestant Association of Churches and Mission, and so many other regional and ecumenical organizations to make this event possible. We look forward to the presentations on unity and mission and the opportunity to share theological traditions and examine Christ's call to reconciliation in the church and the world. May this meeting affirm our fundamental belief that we are to act like Christ and dismantle structures of racism and oppression through our ministries of reconciliation. My co-moderator, the Reverend Gregory Bentley and I speak frequently that we cannot fully bear witness to reconciliation as though we've achieved it by our own self-sufficiency. As a people, we like to leap to reconciliation because it brings peace of mind to ourselves, but cannot be mutually whole without addressing the cause to reconcile. Healing can only begin with truth telling. Healing can only begin when the injustice of the past is recognized. It takes a sequence of spiritual transitions and generative power to practice justice, shalom and faithfulness before we can reconcile. So our first step is remembrance. Then we can move to the remorse and acknowledging of what happened in those areas that we remember. And now it's time to look at our repentance. You've called it ecumenical Christian repentance. And so be it, because that enables us to move to repair and then to reconciliation. Remember in truth telling, remorse is to feel the pain and the loss or the trauma that was caused, and in repent to ask for forgiveness. Our repair helps us reach out to heal and restore what was broken. And if you stumble on any of them in the process, go back. It's important to do that and start over until you have truly identified, owned, and accepted the truth of our histories. Then, and only then, can we reconcile. And after reconciliation comes resurrection. Amen. I must also tell you that we have added one more as we minister to a community who after wrestling for years with the trauma of abuse and silence, invited us to join them as they declared the healing that had taken place. They embraced us to say, the journey doesn't end with resurrection because new life begins when we rejoice. So please add rejoice to your list. With your permission, I will speak about this nation's mission experience as an indigenous woman descending from people who accepted Christ in pre-colonial times. My people have been Christian longer than most Americans. And we have not forgotten that peace treaties were used to force villages to accept missionaries and their messages were to ameliorate the threat of natives fighting to survive 
in our land. During troubled times when our peoples were dying from disease, violence, and genocide, some became Christians by accepting Christ, but resisted assimilation to become Christian like the colonizing conquerors, and then the colonists, and finally the settlers. This truth-telling challenges people of faith to re-examine the mission of the church and its leaders over time to all people. What was the intent of the message and what was the impact? Perhaps these words from my friend and nephew, Jim Bear Jacobs, a member of the Stockbridge Muncie Mohican Nation, pastor at All Nations Presbyterian Church in Minneapolis and director of community engagement and racial justice for the Minnesota Council of Churches. He explains this way, in terms of decolonizing our consciousness, it requires people of faith to begin re-examining the stories that we hold sacred from scripture and how the lens of colonization influences how we read and understand these stories. He says, we are socialized into thinking of things in straight lines. The created world doesn't operate in straight lines. It's circular. So by looking through an indigenous lens, Holy Scripture can take on a new meaning. But he adds, that requires indigenous knowledge and perspective. He says, I tell white people to stop bringing their Bible to me and telling me what it says. Instead, bring your Bible and ask me what it says. We as indigenous people retain a pre-colonial understanding so we can read scripture apart from the power systems and power structures. And so I ask you, did our past mission make reconciliation more humane and justice centered? Does our present mission bear witness to equity and liberation in the reconciliation process? Can we promise greater mutuality through reconciliation in our future mission? Jesus's most central teaching was about caring for the poor, the oppressed, and those marginalized by unjust powers in occupied territory colonized by the Roman emperor in his time. Now our truth and reconciliation work is not over. The church has been complicit in allowing those systems to disempower people when it failed to disconnect from colonial supremacy, when it failed to speak up at critical times, accepted enslavement through doctrines of domination and perpetuated hierarchies of collateral to circle the globe and cross borders. On the contrary, Jesus called on the church to empower, to feed, restore, and love the great commission of the church is to become the beloved community. Jesus said, go into the world and share the gifts you received and how to use the teachings about them for healing. During these 100 years since 1921, indigenous communities have faced land grabs, residential schools for their children, forced relocations, detentions, and guardianship over their people and natural resources. This isn't ancient history. It's the story of what has impacted our lives today, yours and mine. Looking ahead to the next 100 years, may you courageously bear witness to the truths of Jesus's teachings and lead your own conversations, tell your own stories, and share the gospel's good news as good medicine for all the people. We don't want the next generation to be disappointed in our mission. Go and create space for them to offer an alternative message. Give them access to justice through doorways of reconciliation. They need to be able to see themselves occupy those places where they can offer decolonized spirituality and relationships with each other. Christ is summoning us and our mission to a different future. As I end, I say, Wopida Tanka, many, many thanks. <laughs>
for coming and sharing this celebration together. We look forward at this special time to hear your vision, encouragement, and prayers for this community. I close by saying again, mitakuye oyasin, all my relatives, I greet you. So blessings on your gathering and the lessons to be learned together. Thank you. Elon Street, do what we thank you very much for these insights and experiences you, you shared with us. Indeed, the, this gathering was supposed to take place in, in near Lake Mohonka in USA at the very same time we are now, now meeting, but COVID-19 uh, made our, us change our plans, unfortunately. Uh, yesterday and today we have already dealt with relations between mission and, and indigenous people in various contexts. So thank you. Thank you once more. Now we go deep into the history of the foundation of the International Missionary Council and its consequences. We have a great opportunity and privilege to listen to Professor Dana L. Robert from Boston University. She will talk us about what happened in Lake Mohonk and its outcome. She's the Truman Collins Professor of World Christianity and History of Mission and Director of the Center of Global Christianity and Mission at the Boston University School of Theology. That is one of our cooperating partners in this IMC centenary study process. Professor Robert is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a well-known scholar. And we are extremely honored to have her as one of our keynote speakers. At this point, I just want to remind you that you can comment and send questions to her via the chat box in Zoom during the lecture and after the lecture. Professor. Robert, please, the floor is now yours. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here today. Can everyone hear me? Okay. It's a great honor to be here to talk about the history of the founding of the International Missionary Council. On September 30th, 1921, over 60 representatives of Protestant missionary societies made their way to a small mountain lake 80 miles north of New York City. Most gathered at the pier of the Hudson Day Line steamers for a five hour boat trip up the majestic river and then from Poughkeepsie by car. Some of the Europeans took a train up the Hudson from Grand Central Station. Canadians descended from the north. The group of 56 men and five women settled into the Mountain House, a rambling Grand Victorian hotel, famous as the site of gatherings for peace, disarmament, and other causes dear to the hearts of its Quaker owners. From October 1 through 6, delegates prayed and worked. They met in multiple subcommittees and rump sessions, leaving little time to enjoy the large porches, forest trails, or lakeside views for which the mountain house was justifiably famous. Although most came from North America and Great Britain, Europeans represented six countries, though sadly lacking Germany. To the delight of the organizers, Asian and Pacific delegates came from Australia, China, Japan, India, and Burma along with missionaries to Africa, a couple of white South Africans, one delegate came from Gold Coast, Ghana, one African American from Alabama. Latin America was represented only by missionaries. Together they wrestled with urgent issues for Protestant world mission. Now, given all that has happened in the past century, why is it important to commemorate the founding of the International Missionary Council today? I suggest in this paper, precisely because we are facing apparently insurmountable global problems, we dare not forget its vision of worldwide community. In my talk, I will reconstruct how its founding addressed the context of the day and then explore in more depth one case study from the founding years 
the intersection of cooperation and networking around issues of race. To summarize the significance of the IMC, first, I would say it was launching a multi-ethnic transnational network that in fact lasted 40 years. Using the practical language of cooperation, the International Missionary Council promoted a theological vision of global Christian fellowship that claimed the unity of Christ's followers. The IMC stands as a notable example of Christians together responding to world problems. On the heels of the massive trauma of the First World War, Protestant missions tried to move from national and ecclesial silos into a common conversation about spiritual, ecclesial, social, and political concerns. Together, they grappled with the mandate system established by the Treaty of Versailles. They reckoned with the looming influence of the brand new League of Nations and tried to negotiate a public theology as an alternative to the divisive nationalisms of the post-war period. Their cooperative efforts required both audacious challenges to and painful compromises with colonial power structures, as well as negotiating serious disagreements among themselves. Now, in its context, the International Missionary Council was the major Protestant entity with feet decisively in both the global north and the global south. So despite its flaws, it promoted participation by the world's Christian. In short, it laid foundations for what today we call world Christianity. Immediately, the International Missionary Council engaged with what it came by the late 1920s to call the comprehensive approach to mission. As a network of networks, it carved out space to address global issues such as, these are some I have listed here, it had tried to attempt it attempted to deal with in the 1920s, church state relations, intercultural theology, the work of non-governmental agencies, religious freedom, race and gender, theologies of religion, religions and ecumenism. In an age before governments even cared about such things, it attempted to tackle colonial education, the crisis of agriculture, illiteracy, industrialization, and more. Now, the first phase of the International Missionary Council was, in fact, the Continuation Committee. So I start with that. The age of European imperialism made Protestant cooperation in mission both necessary and possible. Simply put, the expansion of empires in the late 1800s accompanied gr rapid globalization and the out-migration of Europeans the world over. The context of competing colonialisms also provided a growing infrastructure for mission-based interconnectivity. Railroads, steamships, wireless, and telegraph connected missionaries as never before. Especially as the race for empire accelerated after the Berlin Conference of 1884 and 85, competing nationalisms and modernization efforts shaped the mission context. Missions were sucked deeper and deeper into an imperial interconnected world they could not avoid, but desperately needed to influence. The World Missionary Conference at Edinburgh 1910 responded to this colonial driven globalization by broaching the idea of an international body that would connect mission societies for research and coordination of shared interests. And the conference voted unanimously to form a central continuation committee. Regional branches pursued the goals it identified in 1910. Based on a proposed 10 year schedule and a principle of rotation, in 1914, the German mission societies offered to host a proposed 1920 conference, which we know did not happen. So the original membership of the Continuation Committee included representatives from multiple countries and included missions from 
India, China, Japan, Australasia, and Africa. They did their work through a series of subcommittees, each of which contain a diverse national representation. To build regional cooperation, the Continuation Committee sent John R. Mott to Asia to organize national and regional mission councils. Simultaneously, European church lead leaders began organizing national mission councils of their own, modeled on the Ausschuss of the German Protestant Mission Committee founded in 1884 and the Foreign Missions Conference of North America that had been organized in 1893 to include both US and Canadian mission societies. Now the continuation committee was limited. It was not strictly representative of all the stakeholders. It was voluntary. It lacked executive function. It prioritized shared interests, including surveys of the field, standards for missionary training and the provision of Christian literature, notably for Islamic and African context. It launched the International Review of Missions founded in 1912. Its internationalist vision was based on the concept of equal and united nationhood. Thus people, members of the continuation committee were explicitly not allowed to be participants and be drawn into the politics of their own national mission councils. They were supposed to be above that. Now, given the tightening colonial vice in which it operated, especially given the hulking British empire, the continuation committee and its regional branches immediately were confronted with vexing issues of church state relations they could not control. Simply put, Without the permission of colonial governments, missions could not operate. Missions that had functioning, functioned before the partitioning of Africa, for example, found themselves shut out by new overlords eager to impose their own linguistic and religio-cultural frameworks. German missions faced huge sec pressure from secular colonialists to teach German rather than the vernacular language policy that missions hoped would be the basis for independence Volkskirchen. Thus from the beginning, freedom of religion was a major worry of the continuation committee, especially in Roman Catholic colonies. Geopolitics impinged. So for example, in 1912, faced with the Japanese invaders imprisonment of Korean Christians and the suppression of churches, the continuation committee drafted a letter to the Japanese ambassador to the US and a letter of support to missionaries in Korea. Now, interestingly, the committee held special prayers for the new emperor of Japan, for the missionaries and for Korean Christians. So they're taught walking this tightrope, this awkward need for missions to survive in the context of colonization, plus resist the oppression of local Christians was a prevalent theme when the Continuation Committee was confronted with the onslaught of racist laws that began South Africa's march toward an apartheid state. So in 1912, the Continuation Committee indicated that extending the kingdom of God in the world, peace and unity meant removing racial misunderstanding and prejudice. And in 1913, the committee condemned the Natives Land Act of South Africa because it was causing widespread injustice, a sense of injustice among the quote native races and is, had bad effects on Christian churches. Now, when you look back at this, you realize that they tried to intervene in these things at all was remarkable with no power of their own nor binding authority among constituent churches Plus a naive optimism, we must say, about British imperialism, the Continuation Committee walked the tightrope faced by every transnational voluntary faith-based NGO, which is trying to remain above politics while being sucked into public issues that affected its core constituency. Then World War I breaks out. Four years of devastation across three continents, 21 and a half million people killed, followed by a huge influenza epidemic. Europe lay in ruins. Survivors nav navigated destroyed infrastructures, the displacement of millions and cultural collapse. 
Africans and Asians were sucked into the maelstrom as imperial recruits. European imperialists did not want to let go of their colonies despite, despite resistance movements. The Paris peace process divided Europe into ethnic states and imposed punitive treaties on the losers. The entire leaderships of student Christian movements were killed fighting in the war. Churches supported national war efforts. Missionaries were stranded in enemy territory, arrested and deported. Now under such conditions, the continuation committee had to disband. After the war, uh, the urgency though was immediate. First was the self-reckoning and Basil Matthews of the LMS called World War I a stupendous white civil war. It had destroyed ecclesial and parachurch infrastructures. It ruined the missions, including German missions. The continuation committee, or what remained of it, tried to found an emergency committee of cooperating missions to meet the common crises that were popping up like so many heads of a hydra. The German missions were taken apart, and as Jeremy Best puts it, quote, the German Protestant mission societies had no mission fields in which their missionaries could work. They had no missionaries to work at non-existent mission stations, and they had no money for which to pay for the transport or upkeep of the missionaries and mission stations they no longer had, close quote. Post-war colonialism roared back in new forms with designated mandate territories carved from the former Axis powers territory. And after the founding of the League of Nations, it was critically urgent that a transnational body of Christian leaders represent the interests of missions and young churches at the highest level they could manage to pressure the treaty negotiations to consider the rights of Christians in Asia and Africa. So at war's end, mission leaders faced at least three daunting clusters of urgent problems. First, of course, was the seizure of mission property. Second was the bevy of church state issues, including new colonial resolutions against religious freedom, mission education, and bad labor policies. We must remember that the new mandate territories emerging from a millennium of the Ottoman Empire were not allies of religious freedom nor of the presence of Christian missionaries. Former German colonies were awarded to new colonial masters, in particular to the Catholic French, and thus the whole mission policy, policy of nationalism changes. So exploitation of native populations accelerated under new masters and threatened to destroy young churches. Now, a third set of issues concerned the meaning of nationalism itself, and missions had to negotiate its evolving forms. So the year 1919 saw nationalist protest movements against oppressive colonial governments. Even though a million Indian soldiers and laborers had supported the British in the war effort, British troops fired on unarmed crowds in the massacre of Amritsar on April 13th, killing nearly 400 people and wounding 1,200, thereby unleashing a, a, the huge anti-colonial movement for, British, for Indian independence. In China, the May 4th movement mobilized strikes against the Treaty of Versailles over the disposition of Shandong province. The March 1st movement in Korea was a nationwide protest against Japanese colonization resulted in the arrests of 46,000 people and the burning of dozens of churches. So you see these issues of religious freedom, modernization and nationalism all intersected and young mission educated Christians in Asia and Africa in particular were leading in protests against colonialism but were themselves under pressure for anti, from anti-Christian movements. So missions, Schools, hospitals, and mission stations were the site of struggle for Christian nationalists who were caught between all these opposing forces. Thus, the tasks for the Emergency Committee of 1919 to 21 were prodigious. First, they needed to construct 
some kind of permanent and representative organization. They tried to pick up where the continuation committee left off. They began lobbying their governments for what the, the Swedish mission societies called the supranationality of missions. The principle that in the treaty negotiations, Christian mission should not be considered national property of the losing countries. They had religious and linguistic freedom issues over use of languages in mission schools, whether they could even teach Christian education. And they felt they needed some kind of transnational structure because the League of Nations had become a transnational structure. Thus, churches need some kind of transnational structure to deal on a global level. Now, each national mission or church council pressured its own government for the principle that missions and younger churches be treated as beyond nationalism. So, for example, the Paris Missionary Society lobbied the French government. The Foreign Missions Conference of North America lobbied the American delegation to the treaty negotiations. Swedish missionary societies lobbied the Swedish government. So you get the picture here. Each uh, mission council was tasked to form itself to lobby its own government. Now, one of the most interesting actions of this emergency committee was to coordinate replacement of German missions. And they tried three strategies two of which failed. First, they requested that German missionaries be allowed to return to their mission fields. That was denied. Second, they requested that German missionaries be put under the authority of non-German missionaries in their own mission society. That was refused by the governments. So they hit upon a third option, which was to let other missions temporarily substitute for the German missions. Thus, the Presbyterian Church of Scotland set, substituted for the Reformed and Basel Mission in Ghana, the Paris Mission Society, the National Missionary Society of India, filled in for Germans in India, and so forth. So you see, the founding of the International Missionary Council was heavily dependent on the founding of regional mission and church councils that quickly mobilized, and one of their tasks was to assign substitutes for the so-called orphaned missions. Now, the apex of the emergency council movement was in 1920 in Kranz, Switzerland, when they formed the International Missionary Conference. So delegates came from the mission societies around the world, including a few German delegates. As secretary of both the Continuation Committee and the Emergency Committee, Joseph Oldman, Oldham presented recommendations to deal with all of these issues. The conference unanimously adopted resolutions designed to restore Germans to their mission fields. It voted the structure of a permanent international missionary committee whose purpose was to investigate and help solve problems faced by missionary societies to help coordinate and unify mission work to support freedom of conscience to unite Christians for international and interracial relations, and to protect the weak, they said, to publish the International Review of Mission and to call periodic worldwide missionary conferences. They also faced some immediate urgent tasks that were similar to the ones that the um, Continuation Committee had faced, plus some new ones, such as they listed industrialism in Asia as one of their key issues. So it had a lot of unfinished business that it tried to pick up on from the continuating committee. And again, it sent John Armott to China and to the Mid Near East to meet in conference. Now, all of its proposals then had to go back to these newly formed national and regional missionary church councils and from them back to the missionary societies in hopeful anticipation that the missionary societies would vote through the councils to support the founding of some kind of central committee at a transnational level. After the war then, what do they do? Well, the first thing is they identified fellowship 
as both a theological and political imperative. And that is a necessary context for looking at the actual meeting in Mohonk in 1921. Here are two of the leaders who were part of that, Nathan Sauterblum and William Temple. And a number of them wrote books and things on fellowship where that was a presenting public theology. The theology of fellowship was seen as a necessary foundation for organizing, for reconstructing Europe and for moving forward. So Julius Richter, the German delegates uh, had been very active in the continuation committee, but were quite depressed as you can imagine, and then started to pick up the pieces again. Um, in, uh, as after the war. Now, one of the major groups that's important to mention is the World Alliance for International Friendship through the churches, because it had been having its inaugural meeting at the time the war bro broke out and the, in Constance, Germany, and delegates had to flee for their lives. In a historic part of the healing process, on October 1st, 1919, 60 church leaders met together and German delegates took moral responsibility for the invasion of Belgium and all united in the Lord's Prayer. So the World Alliance was the first group that really started to pull things back together. Tensions between nationalism and internationalism dominated the geopolitical landscape as Christian leaders reunited and declared themselves supportive of Christian fellowship and argued that you had to have Christian fellowship as a foundation for permanent peace and a new international order. So these leaders saw themselves putting a soul into the body of nations united for peace. Now, the uh, World Alliance for International Friendship among churches said they believed in the power of friendship to establish right relationships and to secure universal peace and friendship must be based on justice. And if you read the literature of this, it's very moving how teams of people are going throughout Europe trying to help in reconstruction. There was witness for peace by both the Orthodox churches and Protestant churches in the Balkans, for example. Another important group that tried to mend the broken threads between Christians was the World Student Christian Federation. Now, I have here a picture of a hospital because the WSCF reconvened at, with John Mott in the hospital where he's recovering from the flu epidemic in Paris, so, or in France. So the World Student Christian Federation reconvened, having lost most of its leaders, of course, during the World War, since it was students who were fighting the war. The World Student Christian Federation immediately began sponsoring, feeding and clothing the hungry ex-soldiers, who many of whom were students. They launched student world, they launched European world relief, and in a four-year period served 25 million meals. They clothed demobilized soldiers and tried to establish friendship visits between students of different countries. So you see the International Missionary Council when it founded was one of the several fellowship networks and the IMC was specifically oriented toward the post-war needs of Christians beyond the metropole. So on October 1st, 1921, the representatives that had approved the plan of cooperation met at the Mohawk mountain house that this venerable hotel had been the site of the 1912 meeting of the continuation committee it had also been the site of the 1913 world student christian federation meeting so you see it had resonance with the people who came together and just as an aside i want to mention there was an orthodox representative to that 1913 meeting of the world student christian federation so with John Mott in the opening chair and the singing of all people that on earth do dwell, the happy memories of Edinburgh 1910, no doubt at least briefly filled the participants. 
So this founding was a hinge moment historically. You could say it both represented kind of the pulling together of European Protestantism, and it was a decisive step toward a multicultural future. Now, Africans and Asians constituted a minority of delegates, but they pressed hard on the agenda. And there were lots of hopeful statements that came out after the meeting. So for example, Georgina Gullick indicated that the presence of the African and Asian delegates, delegates symboled, symbolized a new day and that cooperation meant working with the peoples of Africa and the East. Frank Linwood later commented that to be there was more than just a kind of political or ecclesial act. The delegates were self-conscious of representing thousands of home, supporter, of home supporters, hundreds of missionaries, and thousands of the quote, native church. He said, to be one in spirit, to be one in Christ, is more than outward cooperations and resolutions. What we cannot live without is the communion of saints. So this need to embody the reunion of Christian community found expression in the charter of the International Missionary Council, which stated the successful working of the International Missionary Council is entirely dependent on the gift from God of the spirit of, mu of fellowship, mutual understanding, and a desire to cooperate. Now let me look at one particular issue as a slightly in-depth issue of what the International Missionary Council tackled at its founding meeting. And I've identified here one issue, that of race. At Lake Mohonk, the committee there was tasked, tasked the mission councils and such to study, quote, the questions involved in racial relationship as these bear on missionary work. Now, race was identified at that time as the, quote, clash of color. And Basil Matthews actually said, no generation has ever been confronted by an issue so worldwide in its range and so decisive for good or ill of the future of man's life on the planet. The only solution to race hatred, said Matthews, was equality, justice, and world community brought together by the spirit of Christ. Why was racism such an issue at the founding of the International Missionary Council? Well, this is a complicated subject, but just a few points. The post-war expansion of colonial infrastructure included such things as hut taxes, forced labor, land grabs, restrictions on vernacular worship and education. In 1919, also Japanese negotiators at the Paris Peace Conference asked for an amendment to the Treaty of Versailles guaranteeing racial equality among nations. That amendment was rejected, thereby hardening Japanese attitudes against their Western partners. And Japanese Christian leaders were very, very upset by this. So you have the issue also of Asian immigration to, the, to North America and anti-immigration laws that are being passed in the early 20s. You've got the revival of the Ku Klux Klan in the US, which reached a peak in 1921, the same year as the International Missionary Council. There's the beginning of the rise of fascism worldwide. And there's the resistance movements by Asian and African Christian leaders. And the International Missionary Council also saw itself speaking for or with them. Now we can, from the perspective of history, see limitations to the way the International Missionary Council tried to approach issues of race and racism. First, of course, they're embedded in a framework of colonialism. They, a lot of them then assumed an attitude that's called trusteeism. They assumed they had a kind of responsibility to speak for indigenous so-called younger churches, native churches, and so on. Now, during the 20s, you see a big shift in that view, 
but uh, but trusteeism was the the kind of reigning attitude. We can look back and see lots of Eurocentrism in theology and culture. We look back and we see what we call white privilege, and we see a kind of third culture elitism. The people who are meeting at these high level councils are themselves multilingual, um, educated Asians, um, Europeans, North Americans, Africans, and so forth. Um, not as many Latin Americans as we've already seen from the excellent papers we heard yesterday. So um, there's a third culture elitism. So the question is, what could they possibly accomplish? Well, what did they try to do? That's what I want to mention here. Um, they first tried to do engage in collaborative research projects on race and racism. Um, the Institute of Social and Religious Research was launched by John R. Mott with Rockefeller money also in 1921. And it did some studies of race relations in North America. There were mission education studies, commissions that went out around the world. Now they had the trusteeship model, a lot of the education commissions. And they, these were not directly under the International Missionary Council. Re remember the IMC is not itself, it is just a small committee that's linking to all these councils of churches and mission councils. So it's a network of networks. Thus, it collaborated with other research projects into mission education, mission agriculture, uh, indigenous agriculture around the world. They undertook a network conversation about race and racism via the International Review of Missions. And I've just listed here a few of the articles that you might want to look up that talk about race. We've got Arthur Shirley Cripps article, An Africa of the Africans, in which he said pushing uh, indigenous people into native reserves was a kind of Anglo-Saxon imperial efficiency program, he called it. And he said, I want a racially self-conscious African not to feel himself homeless in a colonized Africa. Another important article on race is the one in the 1921 um, uh, in the IRM. I have here 1919, I think it was, was 1921 by KT Paul on how missions denationalize Indians. And Paul was an Indian uh, student Christian movement leader. In his this pioneer piece on enculturation, Paul defended the importance of Indian folklore, music, poetry, and drama and hymnody um, as important to Indian Christianity. He also objected to the missionary boarding school that took children out of their cultures at a young age. So here you have an Indian Christian leader talking about many issues that are still pertinent today. J.H. Ritson, who was General Secretary of the British and Foreign Bible Society, applied the lens of race to biblical interpretation. And he wrote, quote, once again, the Bible rises above all race differences, not by ignoring them, but by being human. I'm still quoting. He said, white, yellow, black have one heart, and to that the Bible speaks. To the white, the Bible thinks white. To the yellow, it thinks yellow. To the black, it thinks black. Now that of course is very dated language from our perspective, but he was making this argument about the, the good, the, about the translatability of the Bible to different racial and ethnic groups at a time when indigenous prophet movements were emerging around the world and were pushing against definitions of Christianity. So Ritz, the context in which Ritson wrote his article is very important. In 1923, Daniel Fleming wrote an uh, published in the IRM an interesting article called Relative Racial Capacity, where he demolished the 19th and early 20th century article that uh, racial, racial qualities determined one's place in society. He said, all races are capable of leadership. Whites have no special capacity for it. So he's attacking colonial racist stereotypes. 
The 1922 issue of International Review of Missions contained articles by indigenous Christian le leaders, Chi Chi Lu from China, DDT Jababu from South Africa, and there were articles on Sundar Singh and Simone Kimbangu. So you see, um, you've got a conversation about race going on in the pages of the International Review of Missions. Now the IMC also engaged in direct advocacy. It lobbied governments. It uh, filed a remonstrance against forced labor in East Africa, notably in Kenya. It passed a resolution supporting friendship with Asians. It lobbied for the use of vernacular languages. And in one of its strongest actions, it um, supported quote, Negro missionaries. It very strongly pushed against colonial governments and said black missionaries must be allowed in our missions. They heard testimony from the Mozambican missionary Kamba Simongo and passed resolutions to that effect. So you have an ongoing feedback loop from the missions and indigenous church leaders in around the world that's continually refining the kind of things that the IMC is trying to do. Then you've got official publications from the International Missionary Council, notably J.H. Oldham's report, Christianity and the Race Problem, that was published in 1924, and a study report on race in the 1928 International Missionary Conference in Jerusalem, in which racism was identified as a global problem. And the question was asked, from the perspective of race, is the West even Christian? Now, um, let's see. Lost my PowerPoint here. Okay. Uh, now, I just want to, I'm close, moving toward my conclusion here, but I just want to point out that in Oldham's report, he quotes Josiah Royce and talks about the universal community of the loyal, which is an earlier way of the phrase beloved community that Royce later picked up. So I want to point out that Oldham spoke in the exact same terms as Martin Luther King Jr. did decades later. And here's a final quotation from him in which Oldham talks about it's necessary to have the fundamental equality of those who depend on God, that that's the essence of fellowship. Oldham supported Asian immigration to the West. He even talked about interracial, interracial marriage as a positive good. And then, as I mentioned, the International Missionary Council meeting in 1928 just took up the issue of race and asked, is the West even Christian in that report? So to conclude, my conclusion basically is that the things that came out of the International Missionary Council in the 1920s were, despite their flaws and limitations, designed to embody unity in diversity. At a time when Christianity was largely a European religion, the International Missionary Council envisioned Christianity as a worldwide faith made up of cooperating equal and different groups animated with promises of the kingdom of God. In short, the International Missionary Council built on a global consciousness behind what we now called world Christianity. The International Missionary Council embraced what was called the Christianization of all of life, or what they called, the IMC called, the comprehensive approach to missions. The assumption that the church must engage the collective, including economics and social relations, as well as individual salvation. Of course, the IMC was a product of its time. It functioned in an era of Western colonialism. It had its superiority complexes of race, sex, race and sex. The founders of the IMC, though, dreamed of God's kingdom of equality and justice far in advance of ordinary church people in the West. But they also worked within the status quo of Western colonialism. 
So how do we evaluate their legacy a century later? The first warning is not to freeze the frame and stereotype small particular moments in the history of the International Missionary Council because it was a flowing network. It was a work in process. It was a transnational network of regional and national networks. It was continually prodded by feedback from the grassroots. Therefore, its views were always involving, evolving. It, it held conferences in which hard issues were discussed, including listening to negative feedback and trying to incorporate that into analyses of mission fields. It was a site of struggle. It was a process, it was a product of increased, increased global interconnectivity, but it sought to address the breathtaking and toxic stew of globalization, colonialism, and ethnicity-based nationalism in which it marinated. Simply put, over its 40 years of existence, no other Protestant network engaged over such a wide range of urban, urgent issues that emanated from the grassroots of emerging world Christianity. Thank you, Professor Robert. Thank you very much for your very inspiring presentation. I mean, you have opened historical windows and you have talked to us about the hinge moment of history and, and the way you concluded was just amazing. And, and, and the legacy the IMC has left us is, is really huge. And, and as you were mentioning in the beginning, I hope that we will be worthy of that legacy to pass it on. It is a flowing process, as you said. Thank you very much, a lot of you. So, uh, so far, no questions. No, uh, if, if, there are, if there are none, I, I would like to ask you a couple of things. First of all, you were mentioning this transnational characteristic of, of, um, of, uh, of the IMC. Uh, how would you, could you differentiate between the IMC status and position and impact in the United States or in North America in general? And then in Europe, was there any any differences in in, in, Christ, in Christianity at that time? I think it probably was more impressive and more important in Europe, because no, the Europeans were struggling to rebuild European society and to reunite after a brutal war that killed their whole generation of young people. That was a very serious agenda. Also at that time, Europe is more contiguous to Africa and Asia. So there was far more investment there in Africa and Asia than North, in North, than North Americans had 100 years ago. The colonial empires were, Brit Britain came out, you know, had this huge colonial empire that survived the war for a while. So you've got urgent problems of the British government, the French government, the German government. All of these were directly related to colonial possessions. Now, for the United States, you could say that North America itself was the big colonial um, conquest of, you know, U.S. and Canada. But in terms of overseas colonies, the Philippines, Puerto Rico, Cuba, the US investment in, in overseas things was much more limited. Therefore, I think the people in North America were not near as interested in the International Missionary Council than Europeans were. Thank you. Thank you very much. There is one question, so please, Marcelo. Yes, moderator. Uh, one question related to the photos that have been shown. Um, can you say more about the few women that we can see in some of the pictures? Uh, and one of our participants wrote, I know Ruth Rose was key with students and Betty Gibson later in the 30s AMC. Yes. Well, the, you've got leaders of women's missionary societies. And I've, I haven't 
uh, some of the women would be like Mrs. Peabody. She was in the, she was Baptist, American Baptist. She was in the, I think she was in the continuation committee. Then um, you've got Evelyn Riley Nicholson, who was the uh, wife of a Methodist bishop. And what's very interesting is the women's missionary societies in North America were very, more, uh, maybe even more engaged with International Missionary Council in some ways than, than the mainstream of the church. So Methodist women were, wrote a book on the way to, Nicholson wrote The Way to the Warless World. And another thing that the International Missionary Council launched at the Mohawk meeting was the first ever study of women in the world church. So you see there was pressure from women who were members of the women's missionary societies to say, we want a major study of women. So now I talked a bit about race today, but I could have also then, if I'd had time, talk about what was in that women's study where they're trying to do a world survey. But we all know that there are decades of work by the IMC and then the WCC on men, the relationship between men and women, on women in the churches and such. So that's a whole nother area. So some of the women were coming then from the women's missionary societies. Now I showed a picture of Ruth Rouse uh, with that picture from the Women's World Student Christian Federation. Ruth Rouse was the one who came up with European student relief. She's the one who traveled from place to place in Europe and her little early history of the WSCF is an amazing story of the trauma of the students who were the soldiers in World War I. So that picture, I had to put that picture of Ruth Rouse there because she also then intersected with the International Missionary Council later, but at that time was in the World Student Christian Federation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there doesn't seem to be another question. So, this one, okay, please. I think it's more a signal of how this lecture was so inspiring. Uh, one of the participants is asking, so today, how can we reignite similar trajectory in contemporary mission? Well, one of the things that, firstly, I have to say, as a historian, I was taught very carefully to never project into the future. You, you can't use the past to predict the future. But one of the lessons for me in going through this material is the importance of cooperation and loose networks that allow each other to exist. You see, it was a later generation, the, le the generation of v Fisser Toft and others who said, well, this operating by networks is not good enough. We want a centralized organization. And the phrase that I found, uh, find so interesting by Soderblom and Temple and others in the earlier period is we must live as if we are united. We must live as if. In other words, the body of Christ exists. It already exists. We must have the courage to live as if it exists. And that does not mean marching everybody through the same ideological gates. It means collaborating across difference and allowing the difference as representative of the body of Christ. So I actually think we're at a good moment here. We're now highly aware that the world church is multicultural. We are highly aware that white Western Christians don't have the answers. We are highly aware of these things. That gives us the potential to continue working and building networks of collaboration that they may not have a permanent institutional structure. They are shifting. They are collaborating. And I think that the, the Commission on World Mission and Evangelism can have a very important role in helping with this communication of these networks. That does not mean, though, controlling in a way that I think the, some of the early World Council people thought of themselves. 
Now, I'm, I'm reflecting my own bias there, but we really shouldn't take the 1940s historical moment of centralization and impose it backwards to the 1920s. But the 1920s, because of the huge problems they faced, have some lessons for us today because we cannot control the problems, but we must live as if the body of Christ makes a difference. Thank you. I, 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 I like very much this expression, as if. There is one question more, please. Yes, moderator, uh, a question. Can you say a little more about the 1924 Oldham and 1928 IMC publications about race? What were some of the immediate and long-term impacts of these documents and how significant were they at the time? Sorry, what's the last, last sentence? I got your first sentence. What were some of the immediate and long-term impacts of these documents and how significant were they at the time? There was a huge reckoning of, with race in the 1920s, but I think we all see that after a generation wrestles with race, history moves on and the next generation doesn't remember the lessons of the previous. If you think of all the work done in the civil rights era in the 1960s, it's as if now it didn't even exist. So what you've got is when you really look at what did that conversation on race, what difference did it make in the 20s? You find different things. For one thing, if you look at mission periodicals, they shift from saying that we are speaking for to we are working with. You also see indigenous Christian leaders, um, their, their voices appear everywhere. Now, maybe those voices were mediated through Western publications, and I'm limited by using English to see them, but their whole series of things where um, you know, the world church from the Chinese perspective, the series of books edited by Stauffer on letting each part of the world Christians speak, you get a really self-conscious effort for not speaking for others, but working with and helping them speak. There's still paternalism there, but it's better than it was. Um, so that's, that's one thing. Um, I had another couple of points in mind, but uh, I've lost them now in my, you know, senior moment. But that, that's one thing that I think of right away is trying to actually listen to. Just the fact that people spoke and other people listened um, made a difference in how these, these networks went forward. Another thing I think the support for regional councils of churches you know, you, you've got that support for that. During the 20s, a lot of those councils went from being missionary councils to indigenous councils. So you look at something like the China Christian Council. People believed in getting rid of missionary control and putting indigenous people in charge of the church. That happened in the church councils all over. That's another example of reckoning with race and colonialism. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I watch what the time is, and I think there's space for one more question. Okay, there's, yeah. so oh. this one comes uh, based on the Presbyterian Church USA moderator Elona's words talking about repair and repentance before reconciliation. As a church historian, where do you find these languages of repair and repentance could have happened in this past? Despite the limitation, which is human, do you think they did their best in amending their complicity to colonialism? Do you think they defied and resisted the colonial impulse in a given circumstance? Uh, yes, that, okay. okay uh, first, the language of repentance, remember they're still in colonialism. So they're not repenting yet of colonialism as a group. That, that comes later. What you find is an on the ground struggle in one country, one region after another 
where the missionaries and indigenous church leaders are fighting things like hut taxes, fighting things like forced labor roundups, fighting things like being able to teach vernacular languages. So a proper, so what that says to me, you've got region, it, it locally on the ground regionally, the reason the International Missionary Council matters is because it was connecting to these regional struggles and local struggles. The fighting over colonialism is occurring largely on the ground because they're still in the middle of it. Thus, a proper study of the International Missionary Council is not to talk about the Central Committee. You need studies of the regional councils and their communication with the missionaries and indigenous church leaders on the ground in order to actually fully understand the meaning of the International Missionary Council. This is a massive social history project that has not yet been done. Every point I mentioned in this talk could be books, books and books. And so that's our challenge is we've reduced this history to the history of the founding of a little organization. But that's not, it, it was like the tip of an iceberg of networks of networks. So we need social history models to actually study it. We need to talk about actor network theory and other theoretical perspectives, uh, the ideas of entanglement, that help us actually tease out the true, I think the meaning of what was happening. Th thank you very much. I think that was a very good conclusion. Uh, in, in fact, uh, this International Missionary Council Centenary study process is, is about cooperation. It is about loose networks. So I think we are, we are trying, to, trying to follow that model. And I think our time is, our time is now up. I, I can only very warmly thank you, Professor Robert, and of course, our first speaker, Elena Street Stewart, as well, and all the participants being so active with us and, and following this fabulous session. And I'm sure you will, you will join us also tomorrow. So very warm greetings from Geneva uh, and, and hopefully seeing you very soon. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>